Hi, my name is Gal Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Alia, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me, Guy. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, obviously, uh, I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years and, and um, you know, we, we met at a Joe Dispenza event a couple of years ago and, and then you jumped on board with some of the work I was doing. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and as I've gotten to know you, it's been amazing to see your, your personal journey and f- actually find out about the, the amazing things that you do as well with your work. So I'm so glad to invite you on today. And um, what I just wanted to ask you, like I ask everyone is, is that if you're at a party and a stranger walked up to you and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? Um, Okay, that's a good one. Um, I think I would first say um, that I'm a mom, that I I enjoy being mom. But then the second thing I would say that I have gotten to um, start living my dream and helping people to heal and create the lasting changes that uh, they once, uh, I guess, hoped for and stepping on this journey and just supporting them with certain um, techniques and uh, methods. Yeah, I'm a therapist. It's beautiful, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating because, look, you know, you sent me some of your, the things that you do saying, you know, about being a clinical social worker, evidence-based EFT and optimal EFT practitioner, which we can yeah. touch on as well, heart math coach as well mentor and coach and all these modalities um, are amazing like I love them that's why I talk about it all the time and how effective they are but they can always feel a bit fringe sometimes from people on the outside looking in until we start so what I'm fascinated is what drew you to those modalities in the first place why do you get so passionate about this stuff so when I was younger um, I had lots of um, come from a scientific background and then because of my own personal journey my mom became quite unwell um, when I was about 17. Um, I started feeling that real need to um, maybe initially help her but then I ended up studying going from the science field more into social work and psychology field Um, and um, work you know graduated um and supported many people through my work in um health profession um however there was always that touch of not fully nailing to supporting someone and i was always fascinated by um quantum physics by quantum healing that i heard when i was really young about yeah So as I traveled to my journey and I had my own personal experience, uh, one of the family members um, introduced me to emotional freedom techniques and it really worked on my emotions at the time. Um, I suffered in my, my, my um, father who I was really close to uh, died suddenly and um, I started working. I had younger young children moved to the other side of the world from Slovenia to Australia. Uh, and um, yeah, that worked like magic just in about five minutes. So I always had at the back of my mind uh, when I was working in frontline hospital positions, so in emergency rooms, um, dealing with traumas, um, you know, sudden sudden events. I always had a back at the back of my mind. There's more to it, and that's what really then got me um, on a journey of uh, wanting to bring that to other people as well. And I was very fortunate to be surrounded by a couple of colleagues who had a very similar um, experience. So we found a way um, with um, one of my colleagues' name is, names is Jules, and she found Dr. Peter Stapleton. And she does evidence-based uh, EFT, which means that we could start using it in a, a mainstream, uh, mainstream health um and yeah i just jumped on board (laughs) with that maybe we should um explain what evidence-based eft is as well yeah so emotional freedom technique has been around since 1995 was funded by gary craig um and uh it's a they they call it sometimes emotional like a psychological acupuncture so you use the acupoints as you also use uh 
cognitive statement. So you say, even though I feel angry, um, I love and accept myself anyway. So you, you say what's the truth for you in a negative way. And then you put the balancing statement, how you would like to feel. And then you tap in a sequence that's quite prescribed and you tap on acupuncture points, which then impacts your, um, you know, your nervous system, your chemicals, the way they travel through your body. It's quite fascinating. So Gary Craig is a Stanford engineer and he has put this together. So, um, and worked, you know, uh, I think I saw you interview uh, Dawson Church, you know, yes. he's big in EFT. So I kind of just jumped into learning about it, reading all their books and started training. Amazing. And were you, because you mentioned about working in the front line as well, in our hospital and everything, and dealing people with, with all sorts of health and trauma, from what you've witnessed and slowly what you've learned over the years, what's your take on how much do you think the unconscious body is holding stuff from the past? Very, very good question. Um, so, yeah, pretty much, you know, 90, over 90%, 95% is subconscious. And a lot of the things are quite somatic. So when certain things happen to us, it's a bit like um, if you watch television and there's a, clear picture and then there's an interruption and then there's a buzz and the picture just distort, distorted similar to us as we're growing up you know everything's fine and then something happens to disturb us um, an event that we perceive as disturbing or traumatic uh, and then your energy system goes into that type of a response as well. So now they're doing a lot of um, clinical trials um, of effectiveness of EFT. Dr. Peter Stapleton, Stapleton is uh, uh, our own Australian who runs that. And um, they find in quite a lot of, um, you know, very, how effective it actually is in all sorts of areas. Yeah. Amazing. And when you, and when you want, I just want to close a loop for anyone as well. Uh, when you say somatic, the body holding the information. Yeah. Would that be fair yeah, enough to say? That, that's correct, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's a bit like what you teach as well, I guess, through your retreats. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where trauma is stored. So it, the, we have the, in a brain, it's quite fascinating. You know, your amygdala, your stress center, and your memory center, hippocampus, communicate all the time. So as soon as we perceive something as a threat, um, that, you know, alarm sent, amygdala sends signals to our body, so when we tab, we interrupt that. Uh, we start on the side of the hand. We interrupt that um, nervous, uh, you know, that uh, fight, flight, freeze response, and we are more accessible to to then to a therapy because we we start calming physiology and then we can access memories where perhaps that trauma might have been stored. And then you know, but first, it's really important to calm the physiology of someone. And I've done. Um, I've been very fortunate to be mentored by um, trauma expert Dr. Lori Layden, and um, she has worked in Rwanda and in the United States with the uh, you know shooting communities. And just watching her work in that extreme um, difficult situations uh, and learning from her has been amazing. Just mm. calming someone down enough to be able to then access the prefrontal cortex and actually be able to to go from there but until they hijacked as you know in your work um you can't really expect people to start healing because they're in a survival mode constantly yeah. and that, yeah. it's that that order that nervous system is like firing and and almost shut down the whole time is you know we're not yeah. giving our body permission to heal in That's any right. moment which is just mind blowing. I'm I'm curious on your own journey as you were learning this work. At what point did you realize that there's all that there's like? Because for me, I'll, I'll explain myself for a sec. For me, there was a point where a I was running on the unconscious mind. I didn't even know my body was holding this memory or trauma. It was just me. I was so mm. familiar with it. I just thought that was me. But yeah. but as I delved into the work, I realized I could separate myself from that and have a third person perspective to see what's going on, if you like, and then allow that to release. But for such a long time, I was wrapped up in my own belief system and fears. It, it stopped me from moving forward, but there was a tipping point. And I'm curious to know what was your tipping point 
as you were learning this and leaning into it? Yeah, so I guess as a young person, I was very adventurous and quite fearless. And I liked extreme sports, you know, diving, um, mountain climbing and so on. And then I became a mom um, and I started working in frontline position. And I guess I started leaning into that reality of, um, gosh, anything can happen any minute. So it's almost like for me, guy, the fear just crept in without me noticing. So it was very subconscious. And I personally now looking back, believe that, you know, that was already there somewhere from way back. Um, and I've done a lot of my own work. And I think the biggest message to people is that um, nothing happens overnight. It's, it's the commitment um, to, to do, um, you, you know, to commit to your own healing and mm. being able to realize that it's inside you, that whatever you, it's in your environment or whatever triggers you is inside you. And so as I traveled, um, you know, to Dr. Joe Dispenza's um, um, retreat, I was just paralyzed by fear. And that probably is what, what got me there. I just didn't like the way I felt. I had everything in my life. Everything was running beautifully but I just you know was worried something will happen to my children or husband or like there was just the fear that all consumed me uh, and I don't know if you remember but but you know I I was once at through one meditation it became very very clear and I actually nearly left the retreat because it was just so um, so real for me the fear um, so it took me now I think that was almost two years ago or at something least, yeah yeah, and it took me a lot of work. So I've used, um, you know, emotional freedom techniques, uh, the meditation, uh, firstly, Dr. Joe Dispenza's, um, Tom Cronin. Um, then I attended two of the retreats with uh, you, Petra, and Matt. Um, and I meditate daily a lot. Um, and I'm, you know, just peeling the layers. And I have to say my childhood was quite nice and not you know, I was raised by very kind people and be, learned to be very kind and heart centered, um, had my own difficulties, but looking how much healing I had to do and, and really commit to that and wanting to be the best I can be in this life for myself and others. Um, yeah, it's a daily work and it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, of course. And when you, um, you mentioned, because w- when we met, you were overcoming a fear and you have been working on that and then you leaned in and then you came to our retreat. Um, the, the first one was in August last year, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Was that right? Do you yeah. mind sharing a little bit? I'll just mind you watch your hair as well. On the, yeah, uh, on yeah, the yeah, mic. yeah, because of the, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. do, you, do you mind sharing a little bit of what you, can you, if you could take yourself back there before you came, being apprehensive. And then I, I clearly mm. remember you overcoming a fear uh, at that yeah. place as well. Maybe so I still had, I still had, a, um, it wasn't quite as intense, the fear side of it, perhaps I was starting to overcome that with a lot of meditation. But what then once I resolved that, you know, when, once I started resolving that layer, I think the self doubt and the critical voice and my analytical mind um, came into play. So I started doubting a lot of things. And I think at that retreat, it was just a complete shift. And I actually did the interview with, with, with um, one of you and watched it just recently. Oh, wow. And I, and I couldn't believe what I actually felt at the time because now it's almost like a pieces of the puzzle. You know, when they're missing, you feel it. But when you have the whole picture, perhaps, you can't remember, I think it's called apex uh, effect. You can't quite remember <laughs> because it feels okay now. Like, oh, was that me, really? Wow. You, you and know, and that's quite, how we lose yeah. appreciation for things. Yeah. <laughs> because we, we just accept a new norm. Yeah, a new baseline. It's yeah. the same with resilience, isn't it? You mm. create this new baseline and you almost forgot how it felt. Um, you know, and I, I guess in my therapy work, I continue going back to how I used to how I used to feel when I have clients with me or how I feel today about something as you know as you know as we uncover more and more 
the bigger problem comes and you've got to overcome that one. And I guess it's lots of joy and love and, you know, wonder and everything. But it's also you get faced daily, mm. all of us, with new challenges that then uncover some new layer of um, that deep wound of separation, I believe. And, yeah. Um, yeah, you know. So, so I kind of I took you off tangent. So you were coming into, you were watching the video, you were seeing yourself and how you couldn't believe. Can you take us back to how you, how you felt at that retreat when there was that moment of shift? Because it can be terrifying just before we let go. Oh, yeah. And then we yeah. have to surrender. But it's from that surrender, this amazing opportunity to grow comes, right? Well, I remember being really excited to attend the retreat mm. and then suddenly lost my voice, had fever, um, you know, just got completely almost sick um, out of nowhere. And I think that was my resist resistance. And I think I arrived just on a minute and I let, you know, gave myself a lot of time. I think my, my body was just, you know, wanting to stay <laughs> in a victim mode. <laughs> <laughs> and um and once i arrived i think it was the i mean soon as you step into that space the way you all created that safety you know and it might be a bit rocky at first when you walk in as yourself you're bringing whatever and other people's energy but i started feeling like i can lean into it more and more and it was just familiar and then about i think it was the second second day or second evening um, I just went into this complete bliss oh, in, in one of the meditations and it was building up through the day and it was almost like the old me just has fallen off. Mm. Uh, it's really hard to, and, and another layer of the fear. Um, and then I attended the January one and I brought some new stuff <laughs> to that one, but I have to say it was easier this, the second time. Um, compared to August, just, you know, knowing that it's, um, it's just going to bring me to this new reality. And since the retreat, I mean, my life has um, just changed so much. And it was the signs from, I don't know, from the manifestations that happened that I couldn't even imagine. And I'm just so thankful every day for anything, you know, for, for that. But you've got to be open to opportunities because otherwise they just pass you by and you don't even realize they were there. Yeah, you've got to meet it halfway. You've got to st step into your power and step into that truth of you. And yeah. as you do that, things just keep opening up more and more. And it's like, hang on, let's go for a ride here. This is, you know, yeah. and uh, it's incredible. You know, it's interesting because we've had a few people come back for a second time at the retreat. And at first glance, um, it'd be easy to say, oh, it's just, they, they just keep coming back and, um, you know, there's a, within the industry, it's almost like it can be perceived that we're not then, we can go and have a fix, but then we don't take the lessons and don't integrate them in our life. And then we use the retreat just to escape as opposed to learn. But yeah. so far, nearly, you know, I'd say pretty much everyone's there to really embody yeah. the change. But, but what I've noticed from being, because I've been, I'm at every retreat, people forget that. And, 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 yeah, I'm, and yeah. I'm in the processes with everyone and it's incredible yeah. how much every time there's a, there's a new layer reveals itself. There's a new baseline, like yeah. you said, that raises the bar. It, it's, it's continuous. And the, the, the biggest key then is to integrate those pieces in your life in between those things. And, and I know yeah. there's been quite a few that came back for a second time and every person that came back for the second time had a different experience, but very different, but even more unveiling but without the fear, because it's not so much of an unknown, they can just let go even more, which is... Yeah, yeah. it always takes courage, I think. And I, um, I, I think that, you know, we talked about the trust and surrender. And, uh, you know, I um, completely agree with you. It takes so much courage um, to, to be open. Um, because at the end of the day, it's all inside you. Um, and it's and, and around you, but you can't, you're not allowing good, good things to come if you're in this contraction of fear or control or wanting to predict everything that happens um, and trying to control your environment. It's impossible. It, it is just an illusion. <laughs> and working in frontline positions, um, 
that was so clear to me. Um, I just didn't know how to maneuver it, I guess. And it just, um, you know, the, the energy work, the energy medicine and energy psychology and all the meditation um, has um, brought me back to who, I'm, who I really am, closer to who I really am than living from a place of fear. Yeah. Oh, and it's been amazing to watch your journey. You're just powering ahead, you know, you know, and you, you. you're helping others yourself. And I just want to reiterate a couple of really important points because you, you spoke about the apex and that what, like I always think about, I always used to have back pain. You know, I used to play a lot of rugby and then I would take steps. I would do my physio and I would take, you know, some supplements or whatever. And, yeah. and then, and then all the time the pain would just disappear. Yeah. But I wouldn't have noticed when I didn't have back pain because I just, it was just like, oh, it's gone. And then if, what did I do? I would stop doing my little exercises. I would just kick back on the things and I would let things slip. And then all of a sudden the pain was coming back to remind me to go. Knocking on it. Knocking on your door. You've you got to do things differently here, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and for me, um, uh, having context and having difficulties in our life I think I believe is important because when when the the, the seasons come, you know, good mm-hmm. things and that we can really we really don't let them slip by, and we really are able to be in the moment more with whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, we see the beauty in everything, even in the smallest mm-hmm. things in our day. And we stop searching for that external all the time to fulfill an internal need. Yeah. And, I completely agree. I had, um, I had this cough, you know, and I think my, one of my first things was the feeling of fear and, and being, you know, quite anxious about what can happen, that it's not a good thing. Uh, but also I had this cough and I would get this cough and it would be constant reminder. And I remember talking to the, one of the doctors at work and he said, oh, you know, you should be tested for asthma. And then I remembered my grandma who had asthma and I just thought, oh gosh, there's the pattern. So I went to the doctors, was cleared that I didn't have asthma, but the symptoms were there. And I think they were just there telling me, my body telling me, you really need to you know, change your life. You need to change the way you think, the way um, you feel, um, and yeah, live from more from your heart than from your head. Yeah, which is again yeah. hard, though. You oh, know? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's amazing because I always and it's taken me. Don't get me wrong; I'm not sitting here saying I got everything in the bag. It's still, you know, I'm lucky to have a wife that's a naturopath and remind me of things as well you know that i kind of let slip or or do but any symptomatic thing that's happening within the body for me like instead of suppressing it or suppressing the emotion the body's trying to communicate with you it's trying to let you know mm-hmm. something it's like yeah. the the oil light is coming on in the car or yeah. the, are we going to actually go and stop and, and start yeah. to try and check or are we just going to keep driving and yeah ignore? Couldn't agree more. And I think the other thing too is the community um, support, you know, the finding like-minded people. Um, I, I have, you know, your community and Petra and Matt's, and then I have Mind Heart Connect and incredible, incredible uh, people in my life and, I, and, and my family, um, friends, but it is like, it helps to have like-minded people uh, sharing the journey without dropping the judgments a bit more and Ab- just yeah yeah absolutely it's huge it's mm. huge and you know because we, we're in our first week now of the live and flow four week program yeah. because everyone's been in lockdown so me matt and petra have put yeah. this together and and i was only in there this morning watching the community connect and oh. people people were following the tasks and putting their, their images up and and Com- it was, yeah. It was just giving me goosebumps. It was beautiful to see. And the, the most common trait to, to, to witness is, is people connecting and seeing that there's other people like-minded like this, that mm-hmm. they can communicate with openly without judgment. And, uh, yeah. and that's so important because it, it's that fear of judgment that suppresses ourselves so long. And, and mm-hmm. one of the, the biggest things to help me shift in my life was, was to put myself around people that were going to inspire me and lift me up and allow yeah. me to express myself fully as opposed to just uh, keep myself small 
Yeah, and I think too for me, um, you know, that particularly at that retreat, um, I think because Dr. Joe Dispenza's retreats are very, you know, there's so many people. But when I came to your retreat in August, and by the third for third day, we were all just so connected, and there was just acceptance. There is nothing that a person could say in that room without everyone just being in a complete. Um, heart-centered acceptance of whatever's there and we could all reflect in each other mm. whatever was said and it's just this beautiful flow um you know and i over and over again in my own work i started running small groups with eft and heart math and people often say how is it possible that you know whatever we did with that one person and it's now at the moment is everything is on zoom how is it possible I have the same thing and oh, we're more related than we know. And, and Gary Craig with uh, this new advancement, he brought in optimal EFT and he does a similar thing with a, with a quantum healing in a way, because it's a healer within you and all around you that you're accessing. He says at the core of it all, we're all the same. We wish to be loved, accepted, mm -hmm. feel safe, be at peace. The details of our stories are so different, but at the core of it, um, and it's so true. It is just, you know. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. I, um, Ali, I want to ask you a few questions that I ask yeah. everyone on the podcast. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think you might have touched on it, but I'd be interested to see about, I, I like to, um, what's been a low point in your life that you can now look upon that's been a blessing? Okay, there's been a few. I think my, my hardest lesson uh, was losing my dad suddenly. Um, I kind of thought my dad would be, you know, here forever, like invisible, invincible, uh, not invisible, invincible. Um, and um, he died suddenly, pain-free, but suddenly. And I think that was the turning point. Um, and... I think if I look at it now, although I wish to have my dad here forever, um, it was that, um, that realization that, um, you know, I have to be relying on myself. And then when I was in meditations, I actually connected, I recognized my dad's energy. I mean, as, as, as whatever, as it sounds, is through meditations that I, I, it's we're more energy than, than we know and it doesn't have to be you know it's that connection and the love you have with with your parents your your grandparents whoever might have passed that lives on forever and you carry it in your heart and and i think it's just um i think him him dying was probably that turning lowest point in my life because it, it's almost like you have to grow up and find your own way. I was 30 and I wasn't a small child, you know, but, but I think I always found him as a rock, although he lived on the other side, side of the world. Mm. Um, but yeah, and also realizing the connection I had with him was, was um, he was a very extremely supportive person which I didn't always recognize as a teenager, for example, I didn't. Um, and it's taught me how to be a parent differently too and keep reminding my kids, you know, it, what's important and what isn't important. And uh, I think I'm a better person all around um, because of my dad in my life, but also being realizing that you really, this world is just an illusion, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's uh, nothing's permanent, right? Uh, nothing's and, permanent. And yeah, it's uh, yeah. I can relate, you know, because I, I lost my dad seven, eight years ago now. But um, and but how healing is it when you can feel the presence of someone energetically? Mm -hmm. You know, when you start to that's why I love quantum physics because there's a language mm -hmm. around something uh, mm -hmm. that can really start to break down to the Western mind. And, yeah. and make things land. And the more you you look at the new science, the more you look at and inquire these things with mm. with with curiosity and, and an objective mind, yeah. but and even skepticism. But it's incredible how um, how healing it can be and how amazing it can be as you can start to understand things from a scientific perspective to what's actually going on. And th that yeah. science blend with spirituality is so powerful and when you have those experiences it's so healing like i, fe I felt my dad presence at the retreat yeah you know, when yeah. my mom was there and there's nothing 
Mm. Nothing compares to it. Like you know, it's the live it's the lived experience for you, and that's what I found at that retreat, um, the first retreat when I had that experience as well. Um, it happened. It's not like you were in meditation, but it happened to you. You can't say you were driving and walking and you saw your father, but in meditation, you, you met that energy somewhere, and it's real for you. Yeah. And same for me. And and I think. I, I, you can't explain that to people unless they actually, um, you know, go deep and see what happens for them. Because unknown has carries information and whatever that might mean for for us. It's an experience, and once you have experience, whether you, hmm. it, who cares what anyone else, it's an experience to you, and that's all yeah. that matters at the end of the day. You know, and that's... also much better therapist, I believe, for that reason, because I've had those experiences. So when people talk about things, I don't just go in with my just purely analytical mind. Oh, you know, um, <laughs> you know it, I, I think I'm, I can hold the, the space for somewhere, someone much better now as well because of that experience. So, yes. I'm very yeah. thankful. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, what uh, for somebody starting out, uh, looking at this for the first time, what would you, what would you, uh, what tips would you give them if you had a couple of minutes for them and they're like, I don't know anything. Where do I go? I'm stressed out all the time. What would you recommend? Well, I guess it um, sounds maybe a bit like a cliche, but I would go. I would just, I think heart math is incredible, right? And I just encourage uh, people to start breathing into their heart and, and, you know, draw in that sense of appreciation for something or someone in their life. And if they can't do that, maybe for nature or whatever that might be around. Because I do think that um, people just drop everything once they get in touch with the heart's wisdom and we've forgotten how to do that uh, as a society but uh, it works every time um you know if i ha yeah i know either the tapping on the side of the hand which probably doesn't look all, you know all that great if you're somewhere <laughs> and you're trying to explain something to someone but i think the heart mat the the going back into your heart and also just um overcome the fear I mean, it's a choice. At the end of the day, it's a choice. No matter yeah. how scary we choose to stay in that fear. And, and I say that with the greatest compassion because I have been there for quite some time. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a choice. And, it, and it's, life is, as they say, out of your comfort zone. <laughs> life happens. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, the heart math stuff is wonderful. I had a um, friend when listening I had one of the founders, Howard Martin, on uh, way mm -hmm. back in an early episode, probably episode 10 or 20, something like that. I'd recommend checking that out because he breaks the science down. And that, and that was my entry into it. Because if somebody mm -hmm. said to me, Guy, just picture a flower opening in your heart and breathe, you know, I'd be like, come on, mate. Like, yeah. you know, but once I understood the science behind it and actually what's going on with the nervous system and the fight or flight and risk to repair, it all started to make sense and then and then once i had the experience to to sit with it i was in you know it's it's very different so um i do it with my son's friends they're all teenagers and you know they're wow. choosing whether to buy a car or this or that i'm like your your heart has actually the answer and they've all known me for a long time so they kind of open to okay how do i do that <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's very quick ex exercise. It's it's a very quick exercise, and it's fun. Um, you know, you have to have a bit of trust with the person you're doing it with, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> a couple a couple of more questions for you. If if you had to name one book that's had a lasting impression in your life, what would it be? There's few. <laughs> that that's a very hard question. Um, I think the I, I think for me, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza's books were really um, shifted my whole thinking, like the mm -hmm. breaking the habit of being yourself. That's a great the book. The placebo, mm -hmm. the heal documentary. You know, I just heard one sentence by um, I think it was Dr. Joe at that point saying, "If you can create, if 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 we can with our thoughts create illness." we can with our thoughts create wellness and something like that. But I, it just, 
you know it just completely that one sentence changed my whole life <laughs> yeah yeah. So, yeah but there's so many amazing books um you know like dr david hamilton the the self-love books um alchemist um the women who ran with wolves i think it's hard for me in english sometimes to, to remember okay. the titles because i read a lot of anthony de Mello, um was it um awareness i read that when i was about 18 and it just changed my life then <laughs> yeah fantastic yeah it's yeah. always good to know um is there anything about yourself that somebody doesn't know oh or what's one thing I know I was just a very energetic child um, who just thought the world was just there for me. And I think that the, I guess I had to slowly, you know, going, I don't know, the way I entered the world was just like that, I think. And then life taught me to be really humble and become more giving. Um, and I think people that meet me now wouldn't imagine how I was maybe as a child and if some of my old friends would see me now because you know they a lot of them are in Europe they probably would be also going oh is that the same person because I think I live from my heart a lot more than I than I did Beautiful. back then yeah thank you Sharon um last question uh with everything we've covered today is there anything you'd like the, to leave the listeners to ponder on um you're in charge of your your own destiny your current present and your future uh, your past does not define how your future will look like that would be my biggest take that probably helped me that thought um helps me every single day beautiful and uh, and of course you're working with people um yeah. if anyone wants to reach out and get in touch with you alia where can where's the best place to send them uh so i have a page I don't know, on Instagram, on Facebook, um, website, and it's Coherence Personal Counseling. Coherence yeah. Personal Counseling. We'll make sure we link yeah. in the show notes as well. So if anyone wants to learn more about Alia, just pause the button, scroll down, and the link will be there. Thank and you. You're welcome. <laughs> Alia, thank you for so much for coming on the show today. Uh, I always appreciate it. Uh, love your enthusiasm around the work and, uh, and everything that you do. So um, I have no doubt everyone today would have got something out of that. So thank yeah, you. And thank you for what you do for, you know, for the world. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Thank you so much for having okay. me here. Thank you. Thank you.